Welcome, survivors and newbies alike. Whether you're still trying to figure out the basics or you've toured Walton City a few times, this video's packed with 20 killer tips and tricks to boost your game. We'll cover topics from starting the game as a rookie to late game secret advantages that no one else knows. Ready to leave the ruins behind? Let's level up. You need to have an active save file. If you don't, start a normal game first. Now, the most recent build did add this pop-up, which is unrelated to this trick, for which I have my own suggestion for the developers if they're watching. Alt F4 anytime before selecting a character. Start the game back up, and this time hit continue. Surprise! You'll start with two random characters. In this case, we started with Rahul and Sebastian, which is normally impossible. If you ever wanted to start with a different character combo, this is your chance. Give it a shot and see who you get. Chapter 1 Choose your survivors. If you're starting with Sebastian and Diane, you're setting up for some solid firearm potential. Just keep in mind you won't have access to guns until later in the time-limited demo. Sebastian's gunsmith trait affects the following items on the screen now. Number 2. Tip. Here's the key. Diane should be your primary scavenger for metal and fasteners. Why? You'll be rushing toward Weapon Bench Level 2 to craft your pistol, which is the only firearm right now. The exact materials you'll need are 24 fasteners, 21 metal, 20 wood, and 8 firearm parts. For Workbench Level 2, Weapon Benches Level 1 and 2, and fixing the pistol. The broken pistol component is available for free at Value Records. Sebastian will consistently one-tap zombies, while other characters only manage to do it most of the time. He's a late-game character who will come in handy when you're crafting ammunition. As for the remaining traits, Diane loses rest 50% slower than other survivors thanks to untiring, so she's great for scavenging without burning out too quickly. Optimus gives a tiny morale boost, but that small bonus won't have a huge impact. You'll be more concerned with keeping your survivors fed and rested to at least perform basic tasks. Optimus happens before morale loss, and it takes three phases to recover from one gnawing hunger or drain. Poor craftsperson means she's less effective at barricading, so just avoid giving her that task and you'll be fine. Focus on making her one of your primary scavengers. Starting with Daryl and Leo, you'll need to prioritize metal and fasteners if you want to properly leverage them. It's possible to go a whole game without building a weapon bench, but trust me, you don't want to make that mistake like I did in my first playthrough with these two. I didn't build one until late in the game, not realizing that it ends after just seven days. Daryl's iron stomach doesn't negate the morale loss from eating cans of dog food, so keep that in mind when managing his hunger. On the plus side, Whittler is a fantastic skill, offering some great weapon crafting discounts, which I'll display on the screen now. When crafting weapons, remember that bladed weapons tend to be quiet but fragile, while blunt weapons are loud but durable. I personally like the tomahawk because it has a low noise rating of 2, which lets you sneak around undetected by zombies. Unless you're executing one right next to another. As for Bad Cook, I suspect this will be reworked in the future. Right now, it's almost useless. You get a chance of sickness when someone else eats slop, which just makes Darrow a potentially harmful choice for cooking duty. But other people's negative traits just tend to make them less effective. To avoid issues, just make sure Darrow keeps out of the kitchen. For Leo, his tough attribute reduces incoming damage by 20% when zombies are punching him. If a zombie grapples you, tapping the spacebar command twice prevents instant death. So, tough doesn't apply for that. His slugger ability won't make a noticeable difference unless you're actively meleeing instead of stealth takedowns. Voracious makes Leo hungrier, but with limited demo days, the impact is minimal. There's enough food to feed a group of six, so one survivor who needs a little extra won't really hurt. Unless Leo starts eyeing the other survivors like a snack. But hey, at least he's not a zombie yet, right? Number 3. Tip. When starting with Leo and Daryl, focus on scavenging for metal and fasteners to quickly upgrade to weapon bench level 2. Craft any knives and hammers you'll need at least one phase in advance using the maps I'll provide later, but upgrade to using the tomahawk when you can afford it. Want to remain stealthy, use hammers only on zombies that are a screen away from other zombies or entry points, and knives or tomahawks on everyone else. Hector and Kayla may not be the dream team you're hoping for, unless you're a fan of the main franchise. Hector has the same trait as Joe, Gearhead, making him usable for dismantling items. I'll put the differences in item dismantling on the screen now. Medium barricades take double the wood but give you double the strength, while large barricades take triple the wood but give triple the strength. With Fortifier, that cost is halved, which can really save you in the long run if you plan on staying in a single shelter for a while. 
Although the current zones are limited, I predict a key strategy is the rehouse from place to place as it gets too hot in any one area. You'll need those savings too, because with Insomniac hunting your knights, upgrading your bed stations is a must. Kayla's evasive skill gives you a tiny chance to avoid damage, though it's hard to notice with no animations or cues to show when it works. In a quick test, we avoided one hit, but ate all the others. Escape Artist sounds flashy, but in the pre-alpha demo, you only need to craft 4 to 7 lockpicks, so they are super cheap to make. Plus, with Lightweight, Kayla loses 2 backpack slots, leaving her with just 10 instead of 12 over the course of the whole game. Those 2 extra slots could have been used to bring home 4 metal ambassadors each in a single scavenging run for 4 more lockpicks. This means you'll rarely ever send Kayla out, but I've got a solution for that. If you want your challenge to come with a side of extra inconvenience, this duel's got you covered. Number 4. Tip. To really make the most of Hector and Kayla's abilities, head south to gather fabric and set up a barricade at the Texway gas station garden. You'll meet both Rahul and Joe along the way who will prioritize collecting fabric, tape, and wood to get those beds up and running. Just be sure you don't sleep too sound. You might wake up to a zombie surprise. Daphne and Penny are the best survivors, but I wouldn't recommend starting with them if you're new to the game. Daphne's good cook ensures she'll never run low on food, and Penny's sneaky ability keeps zombies from reacting to her the way they do with other survivors. If you're still learning the game, those unexpected zombie behaviors can really throw you off. I'll touch more on that when I finish talking about Daphne. First aid training says medical items are cheaper to craft, but that's not quite the case in this build. Another survivor, Aubrey, has the veterinarian skill that provides extra resources when crafting medical items. For example, crafting a bandage will give her two instead of one. Daphne does the exact same thing. Her resource expenditure is the exact same as an untrained survivor's. Reduces two healing kits, medicine, or bandages like Aubrey. I already touched on good cook, and pacifist is only relevant if you're not relying on sneak attacks. Now let's talk about Penny. Blade Expert sounds useful in a game with zombies and fighting, but it only has value when you're not sneak attack. As for sneaky, it says when scavenging, but to make it clearer, this skill reduces your noise whether Penny is walking or attacking. Watch these examples as Daphne and Penny demonstrate the difference in action. No other character can do this. Penny's Haunted Perk, which causes her to have nightmares when she gets hit, helps balance her out. About half the time, Punch will give her a nightmare, which I think pairs well with Blade Expert, since blades are quick and ideal for silencing a single target. But if you've alerted a group of zombies, well, good luck. Why doesn't this make a great starting combo? If you get used to Penny's ability to move around undetected and then switch to another survivor, you'll be caught off guard by zombies reacting differently than you expect. Number 5. Tip. With Daphne's good cook ability, you should be trying to recruit as many survivors as you can handle. Using a bed will heal one zombie punch. With a whole crew at your back, you can afford to get into a scrap or two. Chapter 2. Recruit your survivors. You can find Rahul at Parshaw Presbyterian. He has two negative traits and his only positive one isn't even active in the pre-alpha demo. If you do decide to recruit him, just know that losing any survivor will add grief to your whole party, so there's that little emotional bonus. Number 6. Tip. If you started with Hector and Kayla, or Daphne and Penny, recruiting Rahul is a smart move. While he lacks strong positive traits, Rahul outperforms both Aubrey and Frank in expedition, making him a practical choice. Daphne can handle extra mouths to feed, and Hector and Kayla are less effective in scavenging, so Rahul fills a useful gap. For Sebastian and Diane, or Daryl and Leo, recruiting Rahul is optional. The gimmick can be found in his short-term utility. Use him for three phases before he becomes too exhausted to work. Put him to work building a communal area, cooking a quick meal for the others. Let him tire himself out on a round of zombie boxing. Then give him a corner to call his own. If you're daring, 
try sending him on back-to-back -back scavenging runs where his second and third phase is. Ideally, let him pass away quietly, sending him out to pasture a waste of valuable scavenging things. No need for a dramatic farewell. Sometimes, quiet exits are the most efficient. Joe is a real powerhouse. You can recruit him by using the radio at the Texway gas station. With his strong shoulders perk, he can carry an extra two slots for a total of 14. Gearhead isn't bad, but his true value is in scavenging, as literally no other survivor can bring as much to the table. Just be sure to keep this guy well fed. Number seven, tip. I've been seeing this question a lot, but whenever you move into a shelter, you automatically get all of the loot whether or not you've searched or lockpicked anything. I'm great. Tip. Joe is going to have his shifts full just scavenging and resting. Plan in advance when he'll catch a break. For example, time his rest period when you're going to spend the phase clearing out a hostile shelter so he doesn't miss out on any loot runs. You don't need Joe to do any heavy lifting, as you'll eventually get it all anyway. Aubrey can be found at the Walton Taxi Depot, perched on top of the last building. After recruiting her, if you back away, she'll prompt you to come back and unlock a new location for you to explore. As for her refined taste trait, it's worth noting that while it says she dislikes junk food or uncooked meals, slop is technically cooked, so she won't have any morale penalties for eating it. Number 9. Trick Aubrey's trait gives her morale loss. Beer prevents morale loss. Once she's had her beer, any junk food or uncooked meals are fair game. As she starts with very low morale, low rest, and decent hunger, she could really go for a beer to keep her from hitting rock bottom. If you can watch the fast menuing in my perfect run video, I fear her and then immediately put her to bed after I recruit her. It's a little survival strategy to get her through the first few days so you don't have to play catch up with her meters. I apologize for saying this a few times, but this is for the people in the future, as of this version of the game I'm playing, Aubrey produces two healing kits, medicine, or bandages, even though her trait specifically only says bandages. It'll probably get patched. Frank can be found at the back of Fire Station number 8, but you'll need a lockpick to get to it. If you didn't start with Daphne's good cook perk, you might want to race over to Frank to take advantage of his cooking skills as soon as possible. Scrapper is nothing to write home about, but bad back makes you never want to send him to the field. If you let him talk before recruiting him, we'll talk about how he used to know a guy named Larry, and after joining, he says he hopes that Larry is out there somewhere. I don't know if we'll ever meet Larry, but it's a little something to mull over while you're enjoying Frank's cooking. Number 10. Tip. Fire Station number 8 has the most food of any location, giving Frank his moment to shine in the kitchen. Because every apocalypse needs a 5 star chef, right? Chapter 3. Cartography. I'll include a link in the description below. If you're just starting out, let's break down some essential concepts with the help of a map I drew for our vantage points and leads. Vantage points are the key to accessing new areas. You can't just waltz into a location. First, you have to have spotted it from a vantage point. Then, you need a shelter that can reach that area. For example, let's say you're itching to get to the 9th Precinct Station. From your scouting location at 38 Irving Drive, you'll first need to locate Griffith & Sons Hardware, which then leads you to a vantage point for the police station. This map won't show shelter ranges because that could overcomplicate things in this small area. The game already does a great job of showing how far you can go from any shelter. You'll still need to explore and find these locations on your own. Now onto leads. This map outlines the order in which you can find them. For example, from the Walton Taxi Depot, the first lead you'll find is Strange Markings which you discover early on. The last lead you'll uncover, Remain Calm, is waiting for you toward the end. But remember, you can only pick up four of each kind of lead, after which you can't even investigate new ones. Completing leads gives you hope, which raises your morale for five phases. In the full game, who knows what kind of leads we'll get. If you have a killer zombie plan, leave it in the comments below. Once the game world gets bigger, maybe the awesome subscribers who like these videos will want to see me cover every new nook and cranny. If you've played the game before and are looking for a bit of extra guidance, here's a condensed map I put together. Well, when I was preparing my perfect run, I went all in, writing everything down, every container, every item, and what I was going to put in my backpack. So after sitting down and sorting through my chicken scratch, my screenshots, video footage for data collection purposes, this map is me trying to condense that chicken scratch into something useful and digestible. Now you might be wondering, why do I have say, 9 to 79 zombies listed in the police station. Am I bad at estimating? Well, no. The first number is the minimum number of zombies you should expect to deal with. This means you might be able to run past them, or if you're not looting the entire station, or for zombies randomly placed, you might never even see all 9 of them. The second number is the total number I counted in the area. Yes, I know exactly how many zombies you'll sneak past in the offices, how many will block your exit when you reach the radio room, and how many are snoozing near the police cruiser. I've counted them all. Don't worry, I've got your back. Let's take Griffith & Sons hardware as an example. You'll see a range of zombies from 2 to 15. The 
15 represents the extreme scenario, like when you decide to start firing off your pistol and wake up the whole block. The two zombies are what you'll typically deal with if you're playing it safe. The reason my perfect run was focused on a pacifist approach was because I don't like how quickly weapons break. This was my way of protesting the weapon durability, and a call to action for players to realize that there are other options besides smashing through your weapons. Weapons do have some variance when they break. Scissors can snap after their second or third use. So for Griffin and Sons hardware, plan on bringing two to four points of weapon durability to be safe. And at the bottom of each map panel, you'll see how many locked or bolted objects you can expect to find. So you can pack accordingly, and make sure you've got the right tools to bring it all home. Now, let's move on to some scavenging advice. Chapter 4. Everyday Life Number 11. Tip. When you first enter an area, don't get caught up in looting right away. Take a peek at what's on offer. You might find items you can use along the way, but ultimately, you'll want to bring everything back to one of the exits. Fortunately, the game offers exits on each side of an area, so you're not tied to where you entered. Rather than leaving with the first things you find, try dropping off resources near the exit, then explore further for anything else. Once you've got everything piled up, you'll have a clear idea of what to take, what you can consume on the spot, and what to leave for later. You can eat, drink, or use meds while on a scavenging run. For instance, Harshaw Presbyterian has six bags of junk food. They take up three slots, but aren't used in any recipes. So sending a hungry scavenger will let you bring them home in his stomach. Old Ballard and Texway Gas Station offer two cans of dog food each, though you might want to have a drink before facing those kinds of consequences. And remember, scavenging happens in the same phase as when you left the base, so if you bandage up during the run, you'll already be patched up when you return. Number 12. Trick. You likely won't need to use this before it's patched, but you can lock a survivor at a workbench until they either finish or disappear. If a survivor is already at work when they enter the starving, collapsing, or hopeless state, they can't disengage from the bench until the job's done, or they are. Consider this a way to keep Rahul barricading until he quietly exits the game. Number 13. Tip. Some zombies like to stand still, watching for you, can usually get them moving by making noise nearby, like running up to a door in another room. But be careful. The more they detect you, the more aggressive they'll get. They'll bash through doors or climb over obstacles if they're really upset. Otherwise, they'll bounce between the two nearest objects, giving you time to react. Number 14. Trick. If a zombie's about to turn around and spot you, you can actually sprint half a step in before they decide to turn around. It's a tricky move, so use it only when you're about to be discovered. And don't mash the E button. The game deducts durability for each press while the E prompt is displayed. Number 15. Trick. Ladders aren't perfect for hiding, but they can be a useful tool on a pinch. Stairs, on the other hand, are great for hiding, especially since everyone's locked into an animation when moving between lanes. Zigzagging the stairs can help you avoid being hit while keeping the zombies on their toes. Number 16. Trick. When you enter a fight, you'll get three quick attacks before a long windup leaves you open. Try swinging twice, then pausing briefly to restart your combo. If that timing is tough, go for a steady rhythm by pausing after each swing instead. If you can connect just at the edge of your reach, you can backpedal after your second swing to stay safe. And keep in mind that actions that lock you into an animation, like climbing a window, table, car, or stage, can actually give you uninterrupted hits. Zombies may lunge and stagger you, but they won't deal any damage. Finally, don't underestimate the power of a well-timed door. Few things are as satisfying as slamming a door in a zombie's face. Since each swing nudges you forward, pay attention to your positioning in relation to the doorframe. A perfectly executed block beats a face full of doorframe every time. Number 17. Trip. The durability system feels a bit like the game developers put all their effort into making the weapons powerful, then decided that the best way to balance it was to make them fragile, which is like getting excited about a shiny new toy only to watch it fall apart in your hands. As if the game's trying to teach you that nothing is built to last. To stretch your weapon's lifespan, unequip it as soon as you start the stealth kill animation, and remember to re-equip it. After all, even the best weapons deserve a little more than one good swing. Number 18. Tip. Since the game operates in phases, planning a phase ahead can be the difference between success and disaster. 
don't wait for gnawing hunger to feed the survivors. By then, they've already lost morale. Keep them fed and rested above the 50% mark to dodge penalties. Timing is also everything in crafting. If you'll need lockpicks, assign a crafter a phase early. This way, you won't be caught empty-handed at the worst moment. After all, no one wants to arrive on site ready for action, only to realize they're locked out with no choice but to imagine the legendary loot waiting just on the other side. Number 19. Trick. The game can struggle with meter and state management when loading an autosave. If you've just rested in a good bed, reloading might mysteriously reduce your rest. On the bright side, if hope has expired, you can reset it by loading the autosave. Also worth noting, a level 2 station bed provides more rest than the shelter bed right next to it, so plan your naps wisely. Number 20. Trick. If you have enough phases remaining until the end of the game, you can collect crops or water from anywhere. Planning on a quick stop at the fire station and then back up north right away? No problem. In a single phase, have your non-scavenging survivors plant while you're searching the fire station. Even when you're back at Value Records or Galaxy Void Arcade, once those four phases are up, the crops will magically appear in your inventory. Alright, that's a lot to take in, but trust me. Once you start executing those strategic plays, managing resources like a pro, and finding ways to outsmart the undead, you'll see how these tips can really turn the tide in your favor. So go ahead, get out there, and show the apocalypse what you're made of.